everyone. I'm so happy to have you along for what I hope will be a valuable 30 minutes for either you or someone in your life that you know and love. I'm Rebecca McQueen from Birth Sense Australia and I'm incredibly excited to be joined by two amazing women who have both in their own ways made significant contribution to women's health. Today we're going to be discussing a topic that many people watching this webinar may now or have at some stage been suffering with anxiety. It's a debilitating mental health issue that affects one in five expectant and new mums in Australia. Today, we'll be focusing specifically on mums and a webinar just for new dads and birth partners will be aired in the new year. So just hold tight for that. Please let me introduce my wonderful guest today. Professor Marie Paul Austin is the Foundation Chair of Perinatal and Women's Mental Health at the University of New South Wales. She's also the director of the St. John of God Mother Baby Unit and the medical head of perinatal and women's psychiatry, the Royal Hospital for Women in Sydney, Australia. As a clinical research psychiatrist, Professor Austin has been at the forefront of Australian and international research into the value of models of psychosocial assessment for women in the perinatal period. Hello, Professor Austin. Hi, Vic. Lovely to be on. It's lovely to have you. Thank you so much for your time today. My second guest is Mia Friedman. She's the co-founder of that women's media company, Mamma Mia, a purpose-driven brand that aims to make the world a better place for women and girls. She's a mother of three and was diagnosed with anxiety about seven years ago. She's bravely inspired millions of women by sharing her amazing story. Welcome, Mia. Ladies, welcome again and thank you so much for being here today and offering your valuable time and expertise. Today, my guests are here to share great information about some of the signs, feelings, and personal experiences of anxiety, and to promote awareness of when things may not be quite right, and what choices we have available to us, should we need a little help. So let's dive in, shall we? Professor Austin, how common is normal or healthy anxiety in, the per in uh, perinatal women? It's really quite common, Beck, um, and there's a number of reasons why that might be the case. Um, if a woman's had some perinatal losses in the past, had difficulty conceiving, gone through IVF, um, those are likely to then be associated with anxiety about conceiving again uh, or for the first time and then potentially losing that pregnancy early on. And as you may be aware, miscarriages are quite common in the first trimester, the first 13 weeks. So early on, may be quite anxious for that reason. May also be anxious because, you know, you may also know that about 50% of pregnancies are unplanned. So, you know, for a lot of people, it wasn't quite what they expected right now. Uh, maybe they wanted to wait a while or maybe they're not ready with this partner. So there's all sorts of other aspects to that. Um, they may be financially strained as well. There may be accommodation issues and, you know, the, the list goes on. So that's, that's quite normal anxiety and particularly at the start of pregnancy we see it. Once things settle into the second trimester, this is going to be um, a viable pregnancy. So, you know, we can start really engaging with the idea of having a baby, um, getting your heads around this, this concept of becoming a parent. So there may be quite a lot of anxiety also for women who may not have had um, the best of upbringings. And, you know, they may be particularly anxious about that switch from, you know, being a, just a kind of a couple to welcoming in a third person into their lives. Um, so that can cause quite a lot of anxiety as well. For some women, the um, idea that um, the delivery might be painful can cause huge amounts of anxiety. Um, if there's any history of, say, uh, personal trauma in their childhood, that could also be associated with high level anxiety about the delivery. So there's so many possible causes. And then once the pregnancy um, you know, progresses, then you can imagine there's all the tests that women have, you know, there's the 18 week ultrasound and is that normal um, and so on and so forth. So that's, that's all around normal anxiety. And then you move into something that becomes problematic in terms of 
intrusive, um, getting in the way of that, that mum actually being able to relax into the pregnancy and um, still function in her day-to-day -day life. So there's quite a lot of lifestyle reasons that people will feel um, anxious about becoming pregnant or, or the birth. I didn't realise that 50% of pregnancies were unplanned and that would certainly cause anyone um, what we would call normal or, or healthy anxiety. Yeah. Um, what, what is it then that can tip women into a, um, not a normal anxiety, an anxiety that really intrudes on their life? Um, I think, if they have a past history of anxiety, that's likely to flare up at this time uh, because we've talked about the normal anxiety that's there for women anyway, but then if you've already got a tendency to worry unduly about things, um, that's going to be one reason. And then the, the, the woman may in fact go into, if it's significant enough she may actually cross that line from having symptoms through to actually developing an episode of anxiety so that's if she's got a past history she might if you like you know go back into an episode at this point in time um, if there's a, a large accumulation of all those factors that we spoke about um, so not necessarily having a past history, but just having, say, issues in the relationship with partner, financial issues, housing issues, uh, a past history of trauma, uh, lack of supports, any current major stressors, other stressors in her life, any of those things would be likely to make her more likely to go from having a few symptoms of anxiety that we might all have uh, you know, if we're having a, a, a rough week, through to actually having an episode, which then, by an episode, we mean it impacts on that woman's ability to get on with her every day, whether it be job, house chores, relationships, um, and all the things that she has to do and cope with in her day-to-day -day life. Yeah. Yeah, so it becomes incredibly um, difficult to deal with and it does cross a line from what you said yeah um, that would you think that the woman herself would be aware that there has been some shift and it's crossed a line or is it more of a gradual uh, yeah build up? yeah really good question i think it's often much more subtle than that and she may not notice it and even people around her may not notice it on the other hand other people may not may notice it but not want to i guess bring it to her attention because they don't want to upset her, they don't want to be seen to be critical, but really it's about educating people, the sort of work that you're doing, really critical work about educating not only the mother-to-be, but her partner and family, friends, the bigger community, so that if they start to notice something's changing, then they can all work together to keep an eye on it and then seek help as soon as they can rather than just sit on it and let it go. It's a um, really great segue actually for me to now cross over to Mia, who is doing such amazing work in the community to raise awareness around anxiety um, not just for new mums, um, but for, for all women and girls. Um, Mia, when did you realise that you first had anxiety? Um, I probably had generalised anxiety my whole life. And mm. you know, from the time I was younger, I can remember always thinking if my parents were late home that they'd been killed in a car accident. Um, and then I remember, you know, when I was in my early 20s, I became convinced that I had HIV and having mm. sex one time. So these were things that I didn't have words for, but they were times of extreme distress. And um, it's funny, I, my, my, my anxiety would, uh, which I understand um, is quite common, and, and I'm sure that, that um, the professor will have a view on that, but um, it would attach itself to things. So it might be health anxiety, it, it mm. would be terrified that I had HIV, or um, fear of flying, which I believe is a really common anxiety to develop after you have kids. I was always yeah. flying. 
flying before I had kids. And then I became a mother and I developed such intense fear of flying that it was quite crippling. Um, so, and then sometimes that anxiety transferring to my children so that every time my children had a headache, oh my God, have they got a brain tumor? Um, and so, yeah, I, I think it's, it's when, when I look back now and there were, there was not really a lot of conversations around anxiety. Even when I had my really bad bout, which was about six or seven years ago, there was a lot of talk about depression. There started, there had been in, in recent times, um, certainly in the 2000s, more talk about depression and an understanding of what that looks like and how that can manifest. And, um, but not about anxiety. And so when I was diagnosed, I thought I didn't know anyone that had anxiety until I started tentatively mentioning it to some people. And they were like, oh my God, yes, me too, me too, me too. Mm -hmm. um, and I think since then, in the sort of the seven years or eight years since I've been taking medication and now understand that I, I live with anxiety, um, it's now become something that's just so commonly discussed and there's so much more awareness, which is just a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. It's, um, I guess, too, sometimes people can say, oh, I feel so stressed versus actually having yeah. anxiety. What would you say the difference is between those two? They're, they're different um, conditions, aren't they? How would you describe that? Yeah, um, such different conditions. So for me, stress is um, caused by something it's a lifestyle factor. So, you know, you can be really busy. You might be really feeling really overwhelmed because it's this time of year. Sorry, there's just a siren going past. Um, you might have to give a, do public speaking or you might have to go to a job interview. That's stress. Uh, and there's a reason for it. And usually the stress of that will subside after that thing subsides. Where anxiety is different is that... Um, like my brain can think, have a physiological reaction, this is how it was explained to me, um, as if I'm being chased by someone with a knife when I'm just lying on the beach reading a book or when I wake up in the morning safe in my bed and my body is in a fight or flight response with anxiety as if I'm in a life-threatening situation when I'm actually not. And, and with anxiety, as I said, sometimes it would pin itself to things like a fear of flying or health anxiety. Sometimes it would just be a feeling of just kind of dread in my stomach that I couldn't relate to anything. I couldn't, nothing in my life was particularly bad. There was nothing that I was actually dreading, but I had this physiological feeling as if I was reacting to something that didn't exist. So that's how I learned the difference. I mean, I, stress actually works for me. I enjoy a bit of stress. And in fact, the times when I've had my biggest trouble with anxiety is um, well, when I had that big, terrible bout was when I'd been to a health retreat and I had nothing, I had no stress. And in fact, my mind had nothing to do. And I've since realized that's a really dangerous thing for my mind and my anxiety. I always need a project. I need to have some stimulation and something to do. A bit like a working dog needs a job. Otherwise, they just tear up the house. And that's what it's like inside. Where have to put it? <laughs> yeah. I love that. It's great to know those things about yourself. Um, yeah. And I guess there'll be no health retreats for you in the near future. No, and I never understood. It's no accident, actually, that on health retreats, they keep you very busy. So you've got like, you get up and it's Tai Chi at 6am and it's all these different things. And then you go to lectures and then you've got this and then you've got that. So they actually keep you very busy. But my mistake was that I went from that health retreat to my Christmas holidays and I tried to maintain that low level of stimulation. So I had, didn't listen to music. I didn't look at my computer. I tried not to read. I didn't have tea or, and into that empty space, my brain invented a problem, which was that I had cancer and it's not that I was worried I had cancer. It's that I knew I had cancer and my body was reacting and my brain was reacting as if it was just obvious. And I couldn't tell anyone, even my husband, because it was just too sad. And I mean, that, that, that is actually crazy stuff. Um, and it took a long time, like days and days and days for that feeling to subside and that terror to subside. Mm. That, that's the word I'm getting. It, it sounds really terrifying to be in yeah. that state of mind for such a long period of time. And I'm sure you had thoughts, that, am I losing my mind here? Yeah, absolutely. And the problem with, um, you know, it gave me some insight into people who have really, you know, suicidal thoughts because when you're going through something like that, you can't get away from your own mind. Um, 
Mm. And so it can be really, really confronting and it can make you really despair. Professor Austin, for new mums specifically, Mia's mentioned health anxiety as a, as a big one for her. Um, what are some of the ways that anxiety might manifest for new mums or pregnant yeah. mums in particular? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I was really um, thinking about that. The health anxiety is something that probably really ramps up because you're in a situation, although pregnancy should be a normal state, in some ways, because we women go in for all the tests that they go for, it's kind of slightly been medicalised, um, for better or for worse. And so I think if you start at the, the kind of the, the journey through pregnancy, then for a mum who's going, you know, from normal stress, possibly, um, normal anxiety through to something more concerning, is she might present a lot more times for checks, for ultrasounds, the blood tests, is my baby safe? I mean, I've had some mums come in and say, I can't go supermarket shopping anymore without looking at the label really carefully to make sure that I don't expose the fetus to some toxin, right? So they're just examples, but it can become kind of an obsessional anxiety. So that's when you're kind of going across that line again, when it's constantly on your mind, the way Mia was describing it, can't, as you say, quite rightly, you can't walk away from your mind. Um, the only time we get a break from it is when we're asleep at night, which is why sleep is so essential to at least give people mm. a bit of a break from all. So that would be one way that they might present in pregnancy. Uh, they're needing reassurance all the time. They're going far more often to the clinic, um, the antenatal clinic than they need to. That's when, you know, they're flagged by the midwives with me, for instance. And then postnatally, you can imagine again, you know, um, post-delivery, if there's been any complications, they might really, that might expand for them well beyond what it should in terms of levels of anxiety and concern. And then you might find, oh, is the baby not settling? Why is that? You know, is there something wrong with the baby? Or the baby's not feeding. And of course, you know, breastfeeding, if that's the way you go, can have its problems at the start. You know, it's not easy for everybody. Um, sometimes babies don't put on weight as much as, you know, they're expected to. Um, but those women with an anxiety condition, they will focus on every single detail, every step of the way, and they can't just see the big picture. It becomes this focus on the little details. So then they'll end up going to the baby health clinic much more than they need to, or the GP, what's the baby's weight, how many feeds a day, and so forth, yeah. And some of the things you've said um, are obvious, but what are the ways that that impacts on those mums, having that condition playing out for them? Yeah, so um, I think it can make even the delivery. So if we just come to late pregnancy care and the delivery, uh, that can be much more stressful than it might have otherwise been pain relief might become more problematic. You know, once you're in pain, if you're prone to anxiety, that pain level tends to go up and anxiety and pain kind of feed back into each other. So they ramp up. Um, I've, we've had women have severe panic attacks right in the middle of delivery, which is pretty horrific. Um, so if we know a woman's got an anxiety condition, we really plan for her delivery to be as straightforward as possible her you know as supported as it can be um, then I guess um, postnatally you know they're going to go home there's there's no they might say that there's very little support that's the other issue around anxiety um, so there's so many steps along the way that they might present to us and um, within the community, within their family, and then it's how do the family support them? What do they understand is going on? How much education do we need to do with them? Which is where, you know, Mia's um, enterprise, things like, you know, Beyond Blue, um, COPE, all those organisations are there to try and educate not only mums-to-be and new parents, but also the broader family. 
and links to all of those organisations are on our website at BirdSense Australia. So um, feel free yeah. to have a look on the handy contacts page there where those uh, organisations are all listed and you can mm. check them out. Um, I'd like to ask you, I know that your anxiety was only officially diagnosed seven years ago, but for you, when you became a mum, did the symptoms change or um, become exacerbated in those early mum or pregnancy days? I really recognise um, what, what uh, Marie was just saying about um, about in pregnancy so my first pregnancy I remember being so paranoid that something would happen to the baby that like I would walk past the body shop and I wouldn't want to inhale in case I accidentally inhaled some essential oil that might cause a miscarriage or something like that and um, ironically uh, in my second pregnancy I remember sitting in the ultrasound room saying to my husband at sort of the 18 weight scan gosh it's just so much better the second time I'm less paranoid and I'm just so much more relaxed and then we went into the ultrasound room and discovered that there was no heartbeat so then the anxiety of my subsequent pregnancy uh pregnancies after that particularly the one I had um, a few years later which was my first after losing that baby was just so difficult to manage and again I didn't have a word for it um I didn't use the word anxiety and I find that actually naming things helps because before I just thought that was how life felt like having this pit in my stomach, never knowing why it was going to be there, feeling edgy, feeling uncomfortable, not understanding why I've come home early from every holiday I've ever had, including my own honeymoon, um, not understanding where this sudden fear of flying came from. Um, and so it was a real, like, I think that again, if I'd have been around, you know, if, if, all the information and awareness that's out there now would have been so, so, so helpful to me mm. earlier in my life. Mm. Um, and to me, medication was a really, really important part of, of dealing with it because as, as we've discussed, when it becomes a barrier to you leave, living your life, whether it means you can't get on a plane, I had to take, you know, I had to take like anxiety medication every time I got on a plane. Yeah. Um, if you can't leave the house, if you can't, do certain things if you can't attend social functions if you can't if it's starting to make your life smaller then you have then you know you've got an issue um and i think that it's really easy when you you know we all become a lot more involved a lot more aware of our mortality when we become mothers and i would be far less i'd still be anxious when i would fly but when my children were flying with me i'd be less anxious because it's that massive fear of what if I'm not around for them? So it's not just what if I'm not around for me, gosh, that would be a bum up, but like the, the responsibility. And I think that's a really normal fear, but when you have anxiety, it just gets the volume on that fear gets turned up. Yeah. So you've mentioned that medication has been really key for you in managing yeah. those horrible, yeah. horrible symptoms. Yeah. What else have you found has been helpful for you in managing um, this, this condition that affects one in five people now? Yeah. What, what do you find works for you? Great question. So um, first of all, I had to get over the stigma of taking medication because I know that that's a thing for a lot of people. And I was also just worried because, you know, I don't drink coffee. I don't, I'm not a big drinker. I don't smoke. And I don't mean like on oh, my body's a temple and I'm clean eating, but I was worried that the medication might change me or affect me like my system's quite sensitive and so i remember my my um the psychiatrist that, that prescribed medication at the time said i can tell you're quite anxious about your anxiety medication <laughs> and i was like yes i just want to take a quarter of a pill <laughs> um, but uh and it took a little while to settle down but so medication is really important but it's not the only thing and it's not a a cure-all so there are other things that i have to be and different people have different triggers for me, I think there are a lot of things that I'm, I seem to find that this for a lot of people who have anxiety that I know is very common. Sleep, as, as the professor said, crucial. I've got to get a lot of sleep. Um, routine, 
really important. You've got to have, you know, the more routine I can have. And even when I'm traveling, things like traveling with my own teacup and taking my own tea bags and making sure I go to the gym every day, which brings me to my third thing, the trifecta is exercise. Mm -hmm. I have to exercise every day. And I've done that for decades. And I always thought that it was a body image thing. And that, cause I used to have an eating disorder when I was younger and I thought, is it related to weight? And probably it's all mixed up in a lot of things, but I've since learned that for me, it's a, it's a form when, before I even realized I was doing it, I was self-medicating with sleep and exercise and routine and also having a project, having something to do mentally. Um, so just switching off is not desirable for me. So it's on, on, on holidays, I either have to do, it can be a project like organizing my photos for the years and making, you know, slideshows on my, with my iPhone, or it can be doing a puzzle or it can be listening to podcasts. It doesn't have to be actually doing work, but I need something to do. Um, I've just started meditating again. I did a meditation course that really helped many years ago before I was taking medication. And um, I did that as a way to cope with flying. And I've just started meditating again. I find that really difficult because my mind goes at a million miles an hour, but I found it super, super helpful. And also just articulating it. So if I'm having a bad day, saying to my husband, I'm having a really bad day with anxiety today. Um, and, and just articulating it is really helpful. Or if I've got a fear, naming it, going, I know, you know, one of the kids has a headache. Do you think it's a brain tumour? And, and you kind of make a joke of it. And ironically for me, and everyone's different, sometimes I need him to, to laugh at me a bit, in a, in, not in a mean way, like you're an idiot, but sometimes your fear feels so real that you need someone to say, okay, that's ridiculous. Because you're like, is it? Okay, it's ridiculous. Okay. Yes, it is ridiculous. It is ridiculous. So for me, that works really well with him not going, oh, do you think it is a brain tumour? That would make it, me feel worse. For him to go, take it seriously enough to go, here are the reasons why it's not. But also to just, you know, kind of remind me that I have health anxiety and my fears are almost always irrational. Almost like you need a check on your own thoughts and a bit of humour to yes. dissipate yes. where you're going with it. And it has to be done with love and affection by someone who does love you and who's not just going, stop being a hypochondriac because that's not helpful. No. And that will, you know, belittling someone and making them feel embarrassed um, about having anxiety is not in any way helpful. Yes, it needs to be with someone that you love and trust and yeah, who knows exactly. you and has your back. Yeah, yeah, totally. So... There's some fantastic techniques in there um, that, that me has mentioned. Professor Austin, is there anything else that you'd like to add um, into some of the, the recommendations for people um, and mm. treatment for anxiety? Yeah, look, I think um, where women have more moderate to severe episode, then they do need to um, consider the option of medication and keep an open mind. You know, a lot of people feel, oh, I'm not the sort of person that takes anything. I don't even take a Panadol for headache. But that is something that, gosh, if they're really suffering, there's, there's such a helpful way to go forward with medication. It's not addictive. It doesn't change your personality. It's usually very well tolerated and it's taken for, you know, a period of a few months to a year and then people can come off it. Meantime, they're learning that, anxiety management skills that they need to learn anyway, or the you know, lifestyle changes, as Mia mentioned. I think psychologists are extremely useful in that way, kind of skill building, formal skill building, to anxiety management, um, uh, meditation, uh, exercise, all those things are all part of it. Um, there isn't one single thing that makes, makes it you know, go away. Um, the other thing is if you've got someone at the more moderate to severe end is sometimes it's really helpful, especially if baby's unsettled and you're needing some assistance with mother craft skills is to consider a mother baby unit admission. So for those listeners and viewers that live in New South Wales, uh, we have, for example, the St. John of God uh, mother baby unit in Burwood. Um, and it's, you know, it's a, a very kind of friendly environment where um, you can be admitted with baby. Um, there's all the support with the baby cares as well. And, you know, it's not uncommon for an unsettled baby or baby that's not um, 
easy to care for, um, to contribute, of course, to an anxiety episode, right? So once the baby's on the scene, you've got mum, but you've then got bub as well and how that baby is, you know, um, and each baby is so different. Some of them are really at the settled end of the spectrum and others are at the really, you know, kind of slightly overactive, you know, needing lots of stimulation, harm, don't need much sleep, hard to settle. And, you know, it's a, it's a kind of a, how do the mum and baby fit together? You know, how do they get to know each other? And if you've got an anxious mum and you've got a highly strong bub, then you can imagine that's going to be much harder. So mother-baby units definitely have a role to play, uh, both in terms of the medication aspect, uh, helping with sleep, because sometimes to, to regulate sleep, to get back into a sleep routine, you actually need medication. doesn't just happen. You know, once you're right out of sync, your brain needs that kind of um, short circuit with medication to get it back on track. So, you know, those aspects are, are really important. Most of the states in Australia now do have mother-baby units, um, and there's a role for those. But then there's a role for following through with a healthcare practitioner that is trusted and that is knowledgeable and has that expertise. I think the other website I would highly recommend is Panda and I think you've got that link there. Yeah. Panda does such amazing work and um, I know they promote Panda Week every week to raise awareness around anxiety and depression mm -hmm. for parents and their website is so user friendly and has fantastic yeah. resources. So. Yeah. Um, would you say that they're the national peak body, I believe. There's also some state-based organisations yes. um, that are popping up too, I've noticed. Yeah. But certainly PANDA is um, an yes. organisation I think a great deal of. And, um, and yeah. for people who are wanting to get support, they can get onto that website. And there's also the helpline, isn't there, where they can ring and have that conversation yeah. with someone who's skilled, That's which right. is such a great thing and not intimidating. Mm. Exactly. And it's run by consumers for consumers. So it's, you know, but with proper supervision in place. So it's, it's really professional. Yeah. So, um, Mia, I, I have a little question. Why is it that you decided to write your story around anxiety five years ago? Um, well, it's really interesting that when I decided not to write it. So there are a couple of, of reasons. Firstly, um, I've always believed, I mean, Mamma Mia is the media company that I co-founded and, and run with my husband. And our core purpose here is to make the world a better place for women and girls. And we do that through um, supporting women's charities, but also through making women feel seen and heard and understood. And to do that, you ha I've always believed that when you're in the public eye, you have a real responsibility as a woman to be honest, not just about your highlight reels, which is what we so often compare ourselves to, other women's highlight reels, but what goes on behind the scenes. And, you know, I've had two things that have happened to me that have kind of changed my DNA and affected me really profoundly that are bog standard comments. One was losing a pregnancy halfway through um, and having a late term miscarriage. And the other was um, being diagnosed with anxiety and having a nervous breakdown. And so both of those times, because I'm also a writer, I process things by writing about them or talking about them. I think that's a really human female thing. We learn how we feel about things and we make sense of them by talking to our friends. Or um, And for me as a writer, the, the extension of that is that I share it more widely. And so partly, I'll be honest, it was for me to understand it and make sense of it. And partly it was because I hoped, and it's always a risk when you do this, but in almost every case, every time that I've done this, when you are vulnerable, you take a risk because people could go, oh, she's the crazy one. Or they go, what always happens, oh my God, me too. And so you make them feel seen and heard and understood. And then they make you feel seen and heard and understood and like you're not completely abnormal and like a failure. So it's this beautiful virtual circle of communication and reassurance that happens among women. But the thing with both of those times is that I didn't write about it straight away and I didn't share it straight away. And, you know, it's, we live in a different age now and social media wasn't around really when um, that happened to me. Either of those things happened to me. Um, it was kind of the earlier days of the internet. And now people 
you know, but I had Mamma Mia, I could have sort of, with, with anxiety, I could have written about it. I already had Mamma Mia, it was already quite, quite a big and I could have written about it straight away. But I think that the, 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 the way that in our society now we, we write about things as soon as they happen and often while they happen, I felt that I didn't have any perspective, insight, wisdom, even understanding of what had happened to me. I had nothing I could give. It was more just like, oh my God, I'm freaking out. And what I wanted to do was provide reassurance and to provide, this is what's happened since then. And I was diagnosed and this is the medication I take. And these are the other things I've learned and this is how I've managed it. So I could offer a little bit more than just, Hey, this is this thing that's happened to me. So I took some time between it happening to me and writing about it. And look, there's a, there's an expression I love, which is, um, there's someone out there who has a wound in the shape of your words. And I love that because it's the idea that by sharing our vulnerabilities, particularly as women, we can help heal each other's wounds by making each other feel seen and heard and understood. So that's why I decided to, to put it out there and, and to take the risk that I would not be seen as less than, it would not um, consume my identity publicly. Um, people wouldn't then discount me from business opportunities or other opportunities um, because I had anxiety and you know what nothing but good has come from it you've I think that you give people such a gift when someone in your um, your profile high profile speaks so honestly and authentically uh, to people who don't have the voice that that you do so um, and certainly I heard you speaking about anxiety at one of your speaking to events in Melbourne and um, I'm just so grateful that for your book for what I've written uh, what I've read in your book and for what you speak about um, to to really normalize this condition that's affecting 25% of the population and can cripple people if they don't seek treatment so um thank you so much for for your honesty and authenticity in putting yourself out there with this with this condition that does either touch us or someone we know and love at some stage in our life so um i'm very conscious of time now we've we've been going for 35 minutes um professor austin before we sign off is there anything else that you're wanting to add or say before we say goodbye no look i think it's been said that really Anxiety is as common as depression in the perinatal period. I think the focus has finally caught up with anxiety and that people shouldn't minimise it and say it's okay, it's just part of normal experience, they need to get the help. Um, and St John of God, healthcare is out there, but you know, across Western Australia, New South Wales, Victoria, we have specialist services in perinatal and infant mental health. So you're not alone and there's lots of services out there and get the help sooner than later, basically. Yeah, that's the important thing. Yeah, don't sit on it for too long. Just, yeah, 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 yeah. So I guess um, as much as I would love to keep chatting about this topic, we've said 30 minutes away now, a little bit yeah. over when everybody's yeah. busy. Um, but I just like to say, Professor Austin and Mia, what you've shared today um, has just been incredible information and really heartfelt insights too from you, Mia. Um, for for mums and new parents and for everyone uh, just yeah. for life so thank you both for your your very precious time and your generosity of spirit in agreeing to participate today mm -hmm. and I would say to anyone who's still watching if you're sitting at home now and thinking hey that's me or um, that's someone mm -hmm. I, I care for and love what can I do um, we've mentioned there's some incredible free call services for us here in Australia and often that chatting on the phone can be a really great place just to start to express what you're feeling and to give you some comfort that you're not alone help is there and things can get better so as I've mentioned the links that are to some of those organizations are on our website if you'd like to go to the birthsenseaustralia.com.au website and um, I just like to say thank you all again so much for attending and for my wonderful guests and have a wonderful Merry Christmas to all of you. Um, enjoy the, the silly season and we'll be in touch again. Keep an eye out for 
next year where I'll be running another webinar this time around anxiety for new dads because um, anxiety and depression is something that can get out of new dads as well and probably hasn't had very much airtime at all. So about February we'll be running another webinar and I'd love to have you all along for that too. So take care of you. Thank you again, Professor Austin and Mia and I'll Thanks. see you soon. Thank Thanks you. So Lovely much. to meet you both. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.